So let's talk about this exam in a little bit more detail. This web page, by the way, if you do a search for AZ-900 using your favorite search engine, you will find the official Microsoft landing page for this exam. If we extend this, we can see that this exam is intended for candidates for non-technical backgrounds. So it could be someone who, can, like I said, is not interested in becoming a developer or an architect going the full route with that. Maybe you will have to understand Azure as a business owner, as a salesperson, or somebody who's got an involvement with projects. It's also good for people with the technical background who do want to learn about Azure, maybe haven't got the background and may be interested in going on for some of the deeper exams as well. It is, could be an optional first step. This is not a prerequisite exam for any Microsoft product, any Microsoft exam. You can take any of the other exams without taking this one, but it is optional, but it could be your first step before you dive right in and become an administrator or architect or anything like that. The exam is a little bit cheaper then regular exams, it is 99 US dollars. Most exams are $165. It's available in English or Japanese. To schedule the exam, you just simply need to click on this button. It'll take you to the Pearson View site where you can choose a location close to you to take this exam. In terms of the skills measured, we briefly talked about that in the last video, but we'll talk about it here again. The basic cloud concepts are not specific to Microsoft Azure. This is worth about one fifth of the exam, 15 to 20%. And we'll see terms in here such as high availability, scalability, elasticity, etc. Don't worry if you don't know these things yet. The next section of the course goes through these fundamental cloud concepts in more detail and hopefully will solve, you know, answer all your questions relating to that. But we can see here, we're going to be talking about why it's better to to do cloud computing from an operational expenditure point of view as opposed to having to invest significant capital up front to run your own computers or your own data centers. We'll look at some of the alternate charging mechanisms such as paying for consumption as opposed to paying for time. The differences between infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. These are fundamental models of way software can be designed and deployed into the cloud. So this first section really is just going over some general terms, more like definitions, so that when you hear these terms like public cloud, you'll understand what people are talking about. And it's not specific to Azure. This definition will remain whether you're using Amazon, Google, or any of the other cloud services. So that's one fifth of the exam, basically. Then we move up to the core Azure services, and we can see that that is a full one third of the exam, perhaps the largest section. This talks about specific, the way that Azure is specifically created and some of the services that Azure offers. When we get into the portal, when you get into using Azure resources, you really do need to understand how Microsoft and Azure break up the world in terms of geographies or geos, regions, even within a region, how data centers are distributed, availability zones, etc. Okay, so this is sort of fundamental knowledge in terms of the way that, Arch that Azure itself, the underlying cloud model is architected. Then we're going to talk about the different products that you can rent within the cloud. So I'm alluding to it, but within Microsoft Cloud or any cloud computing model, typically you're basically renting resources. If you need a computer, a Windows server or a Linux server, you can rent it by the second essentially. And so that's called compute. Anytime you need computing power, you rent compute. And there are many different types of compute within Azure. Computers don't live in silos. They need to be hooked up to something and that's the networking aspect. And so whether the two computers are running on the same network and talking to each other or whether you need that computer to connect to the internet or you need that computer to connect to your own network and not connect to the internet. There are many different configurations for setting up your networks within Azure. Another one of the most popular services besides compute is storage. So the cloud computing is so cheap in order to store things. We're basically at five cents per gigabyte to put files into the cloud. And so if you have uh, per month, and so if you have a 100 gigabyte backup for a server, that's gonna cost you a whopping $5 a month to store that in the cloud. And so there are many different storage options. It's extremely popular within Azure and within Amazon and other cloud providers to use it either just to store files or to store files in conjunction with those virtual machines and applications that are running to need those files. But you can also just store files as a place to put them. 
Of course, applications are nothing without databases. Microsoft is, you know, the innovator of SQL Server, you know, 20 plus years ago, and that SQL Server still continues to be used, continues to grow. And now we have multiple different database options besides SQL Server for working with data in the cloud. There are thousands of vendors willing to sell you their software into the Azure marketplace. And so you can just go in if you need a, a firewall, a network appliance, if you need an Oracle database, if you need anything, uh, pretty much there'll be a marketplace element for that if Microsoft doesn't apply it, it's uh, provided itself. When we're talking about solutions, we're talking about more advanced things besides these core services. So we're talking internet of things, big data, machine learning and artificial intelligence, the server serverless computing or such as fabric or functions. So these are sort of software as a service Microsoft provides that you can use as opposed to setting up your own server farms to do, you know, Hadoop or other big data implementations. We also have to understand all of the options we have working with Azure. We have the Azure portal, which is a web interface. There's also command line interface and PowerShell. So that's the second section of this course, second section of the exam, and it is a significant portion. So if you go through this, it might behoove you to watch those videos a couple of times just to make sure you really got it because getting this right will get you a long way to passing the exam. Getting into security. Now within IT today, security is a huge concern. It's one of the fastest growing areas of technology and computers. So when you're looking at how IT spending happens year over year, the amount of spending in the security space is one of the fastest growing elements of all of the other types of spending. And so you're not gonna be required to set up a firewall to pass this exam, but you need to understand what a firewall is. You need to understand that when you're creating a solution you're going to want both a firewall, you're going to want a network security group, you may even want denial of service protection in some kind of an arrangement to really protect your solution. So you don't have to design the solution, you don't have to implement these things, but understanding these are options that Microsoft provides. Identity is a one of the huge leads that Microsoft has in the IT space. Most companies in the world use Microsoft Active Directory as their identity solution within their enterprise. And so if you're logging into Windows at work, chances are there's an active directory that is validating that your user ID and password is correct and is enabling you to change your password, etc. And so Microsoft extends that active directory that runs in your corporation into the cloud using Azure Active Directory. And we'll talk about that. Of course, security continues to be a huge topic. And so we're going to talk about other ways that Azure provides you to store secrets, keep your keys safe, keep your passwords safe, the artificial intelligence methods like Azure Information Protection and Advanced Threat Protection, which can protect your Active Directory accounts and protect your networks from attack, etc. Governance is a huge topic in a lot of companies. And so being able to have policies in your company and enforce those policies within the cloud is a good match. So understanding that you don't just want to say, oh, we don't use this technology or we do things a certain way, but being able to enforce that in an automated fashion, or at least have reports that come out to say that you're in compliance or you're not in compliance is going to be a huge thing. And we'll talk about that in that section. We're getting into monitoring and reporting. Microsoft provides a couple of core services here to uh, monitor your Azure usage or to monitor Azure as a whole and provide you methods for alerting you when things are not going as what you're expecting. And of course, we live in a world of standards. We've got GDPR, which is a big news in the last couple of years. The ISO pushes out dozens of standards that you may or may not want to follow and understanding how Microsoft implements those standards, how you can be in compliance with those standards if you want to be, etc. Azure government, Microsoft is working with the United States government, the German government, even the Department of Defense to create separate Azure portals for those environments as well. The final section, which is still worth 25%, pricing and support. So how you create your Azure subscriptions, who pays for it, whether you need multiple subscriptions, how you divide resources between them, how things are billed, you know, how pricing works, how you can estimate pricing using a pricing calculator, the concept of the total cost of ownership. This has been a big deal in the Microsoft space 
for decades, understanding that when you buy a computer, you're not just paying the $700 to own the computer. There's the cost of the electricity, the cost of the uh, software, the cost of storing that computer, of maintaining it, having to do updates, you know, any sort of employees that are required to keep that computer running, etc. The concept of service level agreements, a lot of us in our business life have service level agreements with our own customers. We have promises that we make that we will respond to them within this many hours, that their requests will be resolved within this much time. Microsoft makes those same promises to us, and there's penalties, financial penalties, if they don't achieve it. And the final topic of this exam has to do with the difference between public preview, private preview, how to access preview. If you want to get in on a preview feature, you can apply for it, etc. So that's pretty much it. This exam, we're going to start off with the first topic of this exam, understanding cloud concepts next.